when we look at cybercrime, what is it? It's crime. It's committed in the online space effectively. When I joined the police many years ago, I put my hat on on my first day on the 30th of April 1990 and patrolled the streets and I spoke to the community and I dealt with situations that were presented in front of me or reported to me, but that was in the physical sense. Policing now is a mixture of both. Some countries are reporting around a 50% online crime and physical crime. And we're seeing in some countries a drop off in that physical crime. In the forensic world that we used to work, it's around every contact leaves a trace. In the digital space, it's the same. When we identify these threat actors, these malicious activities, we then latch on to the breadcrumbs that they leave behind and we begin tracking and monitoring and surveilling them. The threat actors that targeted the WHO, some of that is, I, I can't release a lot of information about that, but I will tell you this. Given the other targeting that we have seen in the past, I think that the ultimate recipients of the intelligence that is collected from these types of intrusion activities has got to be of a governmental nature. The UK's National Cyber Security Centre and the US Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency have identified campaigns targeting healthcare bodies, pharmaceutical companies, research organisations and also various different arms of local government. Now there are various objectives and motivations that lie behind these attacks from fraud on the one hand to espionage. Cyber warfare is a constant um, and it's very difficult in cyber um, as opposed to kinetic or the physical domain to actually see what's taking place because it, it goes on in the background. And we expect this kind of predatory criminal behaviour to continue and to evolve over the coming weeks and months ahead. People will try and steal to meet their objectives. Nation states will try and do it from a, one perspective. Criminal, like organised crime, will do it from another perspective. We're absolutely determined to defeat coronavirus and also to defeat those trying to exploit the situation for their own nefarious ends. And when you see stories, it's because somewhere somebody has decided to put those stories into the public domain. Advanced persistent threat, this is the name usually given to a government threat actor, a hacker. These people are extremely difficult to defend against. They will usually always manage to find a way to compromise a system when they're dedicated to doing that. And they have almost infinite resources because they're backed by a government, so they have a lot of money. It can make or break a leader. And, and more than that, having the right intelligence can, can quite literally affect or save tens of thousands. I mean, actually, who are we kidding? Hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of lives. There are huge economic objectives for any kind of offensive cyber activity relating to COVID. You've got to think about the huge economic impact it's had on countries worldwide. This is costing a lot of money. Lockdowns are a problem. R&D is expensive. How far would someone go to to get a vaccine. You know, what, what we will start to see is the idea that access to COVID treatments and to a COVID vaccine is a, is a competitive advantage, a nation state competitive advantage. So since the beginning of this century and when I joined WHO, I've been responding to most of the pandemic that have affected the world. And so it has been SARS, Ebola, yellow fever, cholera, uh, influenza pandemic in 2009, Zika, um, chikungunya, and, uh, and now the recent COVID-19 pandemic. So quite a lot, actually. We are uh, constantly attacked. From my side, I, maybe I see maybe uh, half of the attack or maybe one third of the attacks. 
What is very difficult is that I receive uh, maybe 500 emails per day. If you are not cautious, you may, uh, by mistake, uh, open a link that shouldn't be open. What we see usually um, during epidemics is really a tsunami of information. The scientific community gets uh, really busy in, in trying to accumulate knowledge. Uh, the media get very busy trying to disseminate this knowledge to the population. Uh, everybody wants to know more. And so the activity around information is, is really high. That is what we call an infodemic. For me, when we have to uh, face this cyber attack, I always fear that they will maybe use some information to disseminate wrong advice and then after that people will, uh, may, may die because of this. Seeing an attack on the WHO in March of 2020 in the midst of the coronavirus hysteria was certainly concerning, especially seeing it come from a sophisticated actor like we were tracking. It indicated that there was some specific intelligence that they were after and that there were specific individuals that they were likely targeting. Only people like their chief information security officer would know specifically who there was targeted. Table tennis, the connection with cybersecurity, you require to really predict the movement before the movement happened, because without that, there's no time to react. So uh, you, you need to have your strategies all set up and you need to adjust as it goes. I remember talking about uh, that new virus and I was talking with uh, colleagues. I'm not a doctor, so we had no clue. But what we uh, noticed was the increase of attacks. When the pandemic was declared, we had a lot of coordination to do uh, in terms of how we could continue to work remotely and how can we keep uh, WHO secure. From what I understand, in sort of mid-March time, as, as COVID-19 was really becoming a problem across continental Europe especially and spreading into the UK, uh, the World Health Organization started to see a real spike in cyber attacks and attempted intrusions into their computer systems. In other emergency situations, let's put, put in this way, we saw an increase on number of attacks, but not like this one. We detected multiple attacks even before March, when the pandemic was declared. After March, the attacks increased fivefold. The challenging part was constantly receiving alerts and being able to respond efficiently. This was a live attack and it had launched within, uh, I think, an hour or so of when I had detected the threat actors configuring their, their infrastructure for this very sophisticated looking form of spear phishing. Ninety percent of the attacks that happen, they happen through email phishing. They mimic a company or WHO or another organization, and they bring the logo, uh, they bring the correct uh, information, the brand. Normally, this is what the phishing is about, asking you to click on a link or to open a file that is attached. Cyber criminals were quick to realize many years ago that people are easy to fall prey to, let's say, hot topics. So whenever there's something uh, important going on or something hot or something they see in the news on their TVs, whenever they receive an email or a message about that, the probability they will open it because it's relevant is very high. 
Organisations are specifically targeted by the cyber criminal through those phishing campaigns, but they can be very personalised to that person. They say, oh yeah, well this is from a friend of mine, and it appears to be, and they'll reply or they'll click on that link as well. But effectively what they've done then is by clicking on that link, they've allowed uh, malicious software to be downloaded onto their machine, and then the cyber criminal is in the network. From there, they could encrypt your computer completely, or they could sell your information. Also, they could use your computer as a way to get into the organization, which is the worst part. They take their time, they've mapped stuff, they've, they've looked really hard at how organizations work, what the flows are. These are not stupid teenagers in basements, right? These are smart guys who understand, have an understanding of the business or the organization, what they're trying to achieve. Attribution of attacks is very, very difficult indeed. And certainly, even when I worked in the police, we found that very, very challenging. Um, one thing that you can often do is look at the motivations behind the attack. So typically, state attacks are aimed at disruption. They're aimed at uh, sort of maybe stealing information, espionage, that sort of thing. The attempt on the WHO, it's difficult to say exactly what their motivations were. But given that we had seen them target many other intergovernmental organizations in the past, and then we saw them targeting the United Nations together with the WHO, it seemed pretty clear to me that they were seeking very specific and actionable intelligence about the coronavirus. WHO is being attacked um, by multiple groups and for multiple reasons. The typical ones that don't believe in science, so there are groups that like that. There are groups that are against the United Nations because WHO is in the news all the time. Uh, it brings the attack closer. There are a lot of elements uh, related to typical espionage. So they wanted to know what we know. When I decided to go public and alert everybody these, I think, raise the level of awareness, not only about the WHO situation, but also for pharmaceutical companies, for um, uh, healthcare providers. And we all need to be together in that fight. I think what we'll see further down the line now is there's a lot of talk about vaccines. Those companies, those businesses that are there looking to develop those vaccines, well, the criminals want that data and information. It's not only just priceless. I mean, you cannot put a price on what this vaccine is worth, but it's power. The vaccine and this type of science and research really equals hardcore power in the world. Their challenge is that they're not the most secure environments. They're not like GCHQ, you know, but they actually hold very critical data. And they tend to be very open environments. Think about university, how complex it is, with collaboration, with different academics, with the student body coming in and out. It's not at all like a lockdown intelligence community world. I have worked through a pandemic before. HIV has been a field that I've researched for many years, and that, of course, is a pandemic that has uh, infected and killed many millions of people. OK. Hello. So, how's the RNA prep going? Good. Just finished cleaning the hood. Perhaps this year is busier than most, but it's also a year that's been a bit more surreal than most because uh, everyone else isn't at work, whereas we still come to work. We have active collaborations with people, not just in this country, but we collaborate with people in France, in America, and in several other countries where we share knowledge and reagents and we're assessing their vaccines and they're assessing our vaccines. So it's a very collaborative uh, effort.
I think it's very important that scientists collaborate, uh, especially with a new disease, because it needs to be, um, we need to accelerate uh, the building of knowledge. For the companies who are involved in the development of these vaccines, the threat uh, remains very high. The same situation maybe as with hospitals, their focus is not cybersecurity, their focus is the development of uh, new proteins or uh, just the uh, chemicals and formulas that can save people's lives. So this code is then made into a piece of RNA, and this RNA, of course, is the same code as in the DNA, and this RNA is our vaccine. The computers um, are all monitored by our IT department just to make sure that there is nobody that is actively trying to um, get into our systems. On a lab basis, we just have the normal cybersecurity. We would probably benefit from being more diligent with that. I think that more importantly, what's probably worth hacking is whenever it comes to the clinical trial. All the patient data, the patient information, that should all and, and must all be very secure. Clearly there is a huge nervousness in the West around the lack of hardening of some of these institutions that have been thrust right into the front line suddenly from nowhere. They're just not equipped for it. Behind the scenes you will be seeing a huge amount of um, work on the cyber defence of these new frontline organisations. Clearly the world is not as safe a place as we would like it to be. We are surrounded by all kinds of new and different threats. And I think if you can run a business that focuses on helping to try and keep the world safer and addressing those threats, and whether they are threats to organisations or to people, then clearly that's a, a good motivating factor. Given the massive weaponization and exploitation of coronavirus-related fears and our psychological pressure points, uh, I can say with near certainty that there have been some very successful attacks exploiting the, the coronavirus and COVID-19 related fears. Are criminals operating in cyberspace? Absolutely. Are they changing? Well, again, this goes back to are legitimate businesses changing their operating models to cope with COVID-19? Yes, they are. Therefore, why would cyber criminals not be changing their operating models? I know in the case of the, the World Health Organization, for example, that um, there were a lot of different companies came forward to offer support and, and specialist help. So that has certainly been a, a positive story that's come out of this, the way that we've seen uh, people in the industry um, come together to, to help each other and to help organizations that have been affected. There is no incident of encryption because they're using this. I'm so proud of the work that every single one of our volunteers has done all the translators, all the people who help manage projects, all the PR and comms people, the bloggers, everyone who's pulled together uh, to do their bit has just been so inspiring. The fact that we can meet virtually, we can have virtual conferences and events and share information sometimes even more effectively is probably one of the best outcomes of the pandemic work together, save the world, make everything safer in the cyberspace. The game never ends because the attackers will continue and the technology needs to improve and the human aspect needs to improve as well. I had visions of what 2020 would be like when I was a kid and it certainly did not involve me sanitizing a bag of Doritos before I ate it. I'll put it that way. Stay safe, bye bye.